Hey, thank you for joining us again this week. And hey, if you're in live or in person, again, get ready to play the game. It's coming up in a few minutes. Get ready to text in to this number. Um, and the winner for this past week was Sherry Strutman. Congratulations. The check is in the mail, as they say. So here is the fun fact of the week. And these facts are true, so you guys can check them out. I'm not, I'm not lying. It is illegal to die in one Scandinavian town. That's right. Off the coast of Norway, about halfway to the North Pole, there lies the Svalbard Archipelago. It's completely dark for four months out of the year, um, and, and it's so cold that anything buried in that ground does not compose. For example, in 1998, scientists extracted a live sample of the flu virus from 1918 in the bodies that were buried there. So because of that, 2,000-person um, town of Longyearbyen has made it illegal to die or to be buried in this town. Instead, people nearing the ends of their lives must fly to the Norwegian mainland. But hey, there's an advantage to that. You don't have to buy a round trip ticket. All right. Hey, we're going to introduce one of the ministry leaders around here, um, and he helps lead um, Celebrate Recovery Ministry. So I'm going to introduce to you Dan Perkins. Hey, hello, Dan. Well, hello. All How right. Good, good. So for those that don't know, we have Celebrate Recovery. They meet on Friday nights. Um, but we're going to play Two Truths and a Lie. So text in what you think is the lie. Um, and here it is. Dan is a sports enthusiast his whole life. And at, some, at one point in his life, he was, one, an avid surfer, two, a hockey player, three, a motorcycle enthusiast. So text in what you think is the lie. And so we're gonna just talk to you for one second. So, you know, how long have you been involved with Celebrate Recovery? And uh, what would you like people to know about Celebrate Recovery? Well, I've been involved with Celebrate Recovery now eight years. Uh, we when it moved up here to Corona, we were able to start it here at Celebrate Recovery um, two years ago. And it's a ministry that's really for everybody. It's for anybody who has hurts, habits, or hangers. All right. All right. It's not just for drugs and alcohol abuse. No. All right. No. No. Awesome. All right. So, what is the lie? What is the lie? Yeah. I've never ridden a motorcycle. <laughs> okay. All right. So, even though you know the answer, still, text in. Uh, you'll get in the queue, and we'll draw from the people that texted in to see who wins. So, we're going to play a quick game of this or that. So, really quick. Can't be on the fence. You have to pick one. Okay. This or that. Pizza or burgers? Pizza. At the movies, candy or popcorn? Popcorn. What to do? Oh, popcorn. Okay, church worship music. Do you sing loud and proud or are you as quiet as a church mouse? I'm loud and proud. <laughs> You'll hear me in the back. Someone is driving in the car next to you and their blinker's on. Do you slow down and let them in or do you speed up? I smile and slow down. Ah, good for you. Uh, and macaroni and cheese, side dish or entree? With jalapenos or without? Either. With jalapenos, main course. Oh. Without, side dish. All right. All right, cut out the jalapeno part. Um, and then final question. Uh, who do you prefer, me or Justin? You or Justin? Me or Justin. You really have to ask that okay. question? Well, Justin, I'm sorry. That's my man. Boom chakalaka. <laughs> Boom chakalaka, people. Hey, what to expect today? If you're new, um, you know, I just want to ask you to text in the word new to that number right below. So we would love to engage with you. Um, and also we are continuing our uh, sermon series uh, on um, moving out of victimhood. And it's moving from victimhood to victory. So again, share this with somebody you know might need to hear this message. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy, 
come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. But God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. See his open arms. For God so loved the world that he gave us. His one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. The power There's just something I just wanted to share with everybody and kind of celebrate. Uh, on Easter, we had, we had a lot of people come out, um, but we had 59 new people come out and join us for the services on Easter Sunday. And, and I talked to a couple of them and just hearing some of their stories that this was the first time they actually have been to a church service um, in over a year. That's pretty remarkable. And again, you know, that, that, um, last week we, we met back on campus and saw some of those same faces come here. And I will say it was so encouraging um, just seeing the church being the church, you know, reaching out to our new guests and new faces, being hospitable and, and welcoming and taking the time to get to know them a little bit. It was, just, it was just a beautiful thing. There was the Naylor family, and they've only been going here for a couple of months, but they've really jumped in and they've really become part of part of the church, um, you know, really being the church and not just going to the church is what I'm trying to say, you know. And, and they even connected with one of the new families, talked to them, got to know them a little bit, introduced them to Greg and, um, and, and some of the elders and staff here and, and got a chance to know them. So it's just been wonderful seeing the church being the church because we need to remember that, you know, some people that are coming on campus, you know, are in a really tough place in their life. They're looking for answers. They're looking for healing um, and, and just a hospitable face. Somebody that remembers you or introduces themselves to you can really change their, their perspective in coming in to hear the gospel. And just being the church, being, being a community here is, is amazing and, I, and I'm grateful to be part of it. Um, so let's continue being, uh, being on mission 
being focused on, on the fact that we're not just here for ourselves, we're here for a purpose. And that is to make God known, to represent his character, and, and to help people, celebrate with people, but also to help and care for people. And so again, I just want to remind us all, we are here for a purpose, we are gathering for a purpose, and that is to glorify God. And whether it is our time, or our talents, or our resources, um, we're pulling those together to do those things. So, you know, uh, there's many ways to give. You can give online, you can give with our app, um, or you can mail in a check or whatever. So, um, you know, but just using our resources, but also using us as people to represent Christ is a powerful thing. And just pray with me right now. Lord, Father God, we just thank you for this time, Lord, that you have called us to, that you have brought us together for a specific time, for a specific purpose. And that is, to make you known, to disciple people, to make you known. So Lord, use all of our gifts, all of our talents, and all of our treasures for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. There's an old story out there about how you train an elephant in the circus to stay in their spot. When the elephant is really young and really light, they would put a chain around its foot and attach it to a stake in the ground. So that little baby elephant could never get too far. It would pull on that chain and pull on that stake, but never be able to move beyond the radius of the distance of the chain. But as that elephant grew older, it was trained by that chain and it had become a, a child that was put into a state of what we'd call helplessness. He, he couldn't break the chain, he couldn't do anything, and so eventually they would simply take a stake in the ground, a wood stake, and tie a rope to the leg of that elephant. And the elephant would stay put because it had come to believe that that rope was keeping it like the chain. And so here's the thing about victimhood. Victimhood trains us. Victimhood prepares us for a life in which we feel like we can't leave for a life in which we can't remove ourselves. We've been talking about this concept of victimhood. We've been discussing this idea of whether we are in the victimhood and how to get out of the victimhood. In our week one back on Easter, we talked about the simple fact, the way to move out of victimhood is to follow the victor. And we, then we looked last week at the idea of whether or not we are in the victimhood. And we looked at some of those key distinctions and the shame and those pieces that may be showing that we're there. And I wanna challenge you again, this series is about one thing, no matter how you wound up in victimhood, whether you were a victim of true horrific traumas, or whether maybe you ended up there because you were raised in, or maybe because you're kind of trying to cover some kind of shame, you know what's going on. We all need to leave the victimhood. That's not a strategy for life and living. That is a strategy for failure. And what I want to do in this series is, again, continue to challenge you and challenge me to get out of victimhood, to move on and follow the victor. But before we can do that, before we can leave, we must see why we stay. Before we can get out of this place, we've got to be able to realize that there are things like that elephant that are keeping us here. And they may be small now, and they may be tiny now, and they may not be what we think they are, but they feel like a chain. And what I want to do is challenge you to examine those things, to examine every reason why you're staying in the victimhood and be ready to count the cost. Because everything that keeps us there comes with a price. 
sort of like moving in general, right? You have to deal with the asking price before you're going to pack the boxes. And that's what we're going to do. Next week, we'll talk about how to pack boxes and get going. In this case, again, we want to figure out before we leave why, that why we stay. And, and so we want to really engage in looking at that. And so in order to do that, I want to introduce you to this concept of letting go. Jesus gives it to us. And this is necessary to start our mindset rightly. Jesus tells us that in order to truly follow the victor, in order to truly go with him, we're going to have to count that cost. He told us, his, told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, if you're going to follow the victor, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? You could gain all the, all the benefits of victimhood. You could gain all the things you think you're gathering, all the stuff we're talking about. But in the end, what's it matter if you lose your soul? We, Jesus isn't in the victimhood. Jesus is in victory. And we want to follow the victory. That means as we go through these things, we've got to prepare our hearts to let go of some stuff. We've got to prepare our hearts to deal with what holds us there and to mourn and let it go. And I say that at the beginning because I want us to keep that mentality as we begin to look at a particular person who will not follow this at all. In fact, we find him in 2 Samuel chapter 13. His name is Absalom. If you've got a Bible, I'm asking you, grab it, open it up. Not all the verses are going to be on the screen, but you're going to want to be able to kind of follow along, mark it, read it later, get engaged with your Bible. Um, you may not be a victim. You may not be in victimhood. You may be like, this series doesn't count, but it does because all of us have the opportunity through any kind of trauma to interrupt, in, end up in these situations. And I want to warn us and challenge us to let Absalom be a warning. Let him be somebody that helps us look at what gives us this reason to stay. Why is it that we want to hang out? And we need to know that before we leave. So let's start off here in 2 Samuel chapter 13. Now we begin with a situation. David has just sinned. He has done that whole Bathsheba thing, and now the sword is coming to his house, as Nathan the prophet tells him. And it begins in a horrific manner. If you have young children listening, you probably want to let them out for a bit because this portion of the story, the inciting trauma, is pretty, um, pretty radical and pretty disturbing, probably not good for really young listeners or viewers. And so, give you a second to do that. And now, he begins this way. Now, Absalom has a sister, and she was beautiful. Her name was Tamar, and you can read this at the beginning. And Tamar was kind of hanging out and around the family, and unfortunately what happens is Absalom has a brother, the oldest brother, the actual crown prince, the one who is supposed to be king. His name is Amnon. Now, Amnon looks at his sister and falls in love, love sick, it's lust sick, basically, wants her badly, winds up being given horrible advice by a friend to have her make food while he's pretending to be ill, and in the end, he rapes his sister. Now, that is just horrible and, and disgusting and awful, and Tamar winds up becoming a person who has to live in what in their world is a living death. She's unmarriable now. She cannot, she's not ever going to have children. She's basically going to be a widow or, or a woman without a, without a family the rest of her life. So she tears her robes and she's kicked out by Amnon because he's just as disgusted by what he did and kicks her out and blames her for it, basically. And next thing you know, you end up with Absalom, her brother, stepping into the situation. That's where we pick up, and I want to show you this, where Absalom steps in in verse 20. It says, and her brother Absalom said to her, Has Amnon, your brother, been with you? Now hold your peace, my sister. He is your brother. Do not take this to heart. Trying to comfort her in a really bad way, right? So not good, but he's doing his best. So Tamar lived a desolate woman in her brother Absalom's house. When King David heard of all these things, well, he was very angry. But Absalom spoke to Amnon, neither good nor bad. Okay? For Absalom hated Amnon because he had violated his sister Tamar. Now, what we have here is a very difficult scenario. And before, like we've been saying, before we can leave, we've got to look at why we stay. And Absalom steps into this situation and uh, gets engaged with his sister, offering her aid. Now, the, the victim in this scene is Tamar, not Absalom. Tamar is the victim, and, and Absalom does some good things and does some bad things. 
But the first thing he does is he goes and calms her down and makes her stay quiet for the sake of the kingdom or something. I don't get it. It's not a healthy thing that he does there. But then he provides her aid. He actually gives her everything that she needs for life. And that's critical because she was going to be poor. But here's the thing. That aid is going to become a crutch for her. You see, you may be staying because of the aid that you're getting. Absalom provides for the physical needs of his sister. Absalom provides for everything that uh, she could want in the sense of, of all the good. But he stops Tamar from mourning. He stops Tamar from actually seeking justice. These are not good things. He doesn't provide a way out. He doesn't provide justice for her. He just provides for the physical need. In a way, he makes her dependent upon him. And in fact, many of you who are victims, many of you have suffered great traumas, many of you have suffered under poverty or suffered under some kind of system in which you have been stuck, maybe you are finding yourself stuck under the aid that has been offered to you. And that aid can be actually very detrimental because if it's not an aid to get you to a place where you can move on with life, it's an aid that's going to keep you in victimhood. In fact, we know that we, we read a book around here called When Helping Hurts, and that's its primary goal is to warn us that in our desire to help people, in our actual good acts to get out there and, and care for somebody, we can wind up being more of a problem by making them dependent upon us. We become a codependent or we become somebody who enables somebody uh, into their situation. We see this with homelessness. We can see this with drug addicts and family members who, who won't draw the hard line and they'll codependently keep caring and meeting their needs. We see this in the sense with mentally ill or abusive people who, who can't leave because they may lose the very, the very funding and the help in their life. And they, so they're not going to go for the divorce. They're too scared for their lives. And so they stay in a, as victims and they stay in that state. All of us can find ourselves in a situation where we're receiving aid and we're receiving care and we're receiving something that's buoying us up, keeping us there, be it on welfare, be it some kind of support because we're, we're hurt or a disability or something. And that can actually cause us to feel stuck. And we wind up wondering, how could I ever move on with this aid helping me out? And I just my question is, do you feel trapped by that aid? Because it can cause you to feel like you don't have responsibility of your life anymore and cause you to feel like you can't get away, that you can't become human. And what I want to engage with you is, is it's going to be hard, but you, we need to set a plan to set apart that age. You need to mourn that it may be harder financially, but at least you'll be on the track to begin to get hold of your life and live. Now, there needs to be a process there, so you need to sit down with somebody who can help you out and help you plan to get moving off of that aid, to get you into a different kind of aid, which is support back to living. You need to have a plan. You need to engage a small group. You need to engage a counseling group. Maybe it's CR or something like that that's going to help you work with those habits, those hurts, those hang-ups to remove that, that aid that's holding you in. It's use, you're using for that drug money or you name it. And you're going to need to move forward and communicate that plan to your community that wants to help you move free to freedom. And this is critical because you got to, that, that what's keeping us there is that aid at times. And I want to encourage you, you don't have to stay there. And I believe Absalom actually was doing this um, because he had moved into victimhood. His sister had been harmed. He takes it as a personal offense. He is now living in victimhood and living there in bitterness. As we saw, he, he literally never speaks to Amnon. He never talks about his distaste. He just kind of leaves it like, cool, you know, whatever, you know. But he's plotting. He's planning. In fact, what we see as we continue on in verse 23 is how deep this plan goes. He says, after two full years, Absalom had sheep shears at Baal Hazor, which is near Ephraim, in Am and Absalom invited all the king's sons. Now, we start right here because he, he invites dad. He says, come to this party. I want to do a big party for sheep shearing. It's going to be awesome. This is very common. And a motif in the, uh, in the Hebrew Bible of something bad's about to happen. It's sort of like when a dog barks in a movie. You know something bad's about to occur. And so what we see here is, hey, this isn't good. And David leans in. He's like, well, I'm not going to come, but I'll give you my blessing. He's like, well, let Amnon come. He's like, well, why do you want Amnon to be there? And you know, Absalom pitches a fit. Oh, you never let me have a party with my friends. And that, you know, kind of thing, right? So David's like, fine, let Absalom, Amnon go, whatever. And so while they're gathering for the party, Absalom commands his servants and tells them this. We skip down here to this verse. Then Absalom commanded, and this is verse 28, commanded his servants, 
Mark when Amnon's heart is merry with wine. Figure out when he's drunk. And when I say to you, strike Amnon, then kill him. Do not fear. Have I not commanded you? Be courageous. Be valiant. Right? And so the servants of Absalom did to Amnon as Absalom had commanded. And then all the king's sons arose. Each fled to the mountain on their mule and they fled. And, and so what occurs now is that Absalom seeks out this vengeance. You see, what often can keep somebody in the middle of the victimhood, what often holds us there is the fact that we want some justice, and it may be that you're seeking vengeance. What holds us there? What keeps us there? Uh, before we can leave, we've got to see why we stay, and it may be we stay for vengeance. Absalom had stayed there now two years seeking vengeance, seeking a way to get back to his brother, seeking a way on personal vengeance. And to be quite honest, he reveals to us what can often be what holds us there. And then you're stewing over it. You don't want to let go of the hurt and the harm and the evil that they've done because, man, this guy needs to be brought down. Well, here's the problem. Absalom had a route, right? Absalom could have gone to his father and petitioned. Tamar could have gone to his father and petitioned. If that didn't work... He could have done what David did when he was being unjustly pursued, and that was trust the Lord. Seek a spiritual vengeance. Speak, seek God to bring about the vengeance. And if you're going to be able to let go of vengeance and move out, you're going to have to release that vengeance. You're going to have to release the justice to God because God will bring it. And this is if you've already dealt with, hey, the justice that should be brought by the government system or the justice that should be brought by a church system like church discipline. Hopefully, you've worked through Matthew 18, you've talked to that person, you've brought other people, you've done all that. You need to find a grievance, you need to have it met. But here's the thing, it may be that you are stuck in victimhood because you're seeking a vengeance that's beyond any justice earth can give you. At that point, you have to give it to God. You can't take it upon yourself. You can't become personal about it. God puts it this way. Paul's writing in the book of Romans, he says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Just don't do it. Leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. God promises you that He will bring the vengeance. God promises that He will make it right. He'll justify the situation. He'll bring about His punishment in the end on that day. And we need to trust that because that is what God is out to do. He is out to release us from our desire to hold on to vengeance. But there's something else that comes with this. With vengeance and with this idea that I get the right to tell somebody what to do, unfortunately, is this situation of moral superiority. Absalom believes he's the moral superior here. Absalom believes he knows what's best. Dad's not going to handle this. I'm going to handle this. And the brothers aren't going to handle this. I'm going to handle this. In fact, I'm going to handle this so rightly, I'm going to kill him. And so in Absalom's mind, he cannot do any evil because he is only doing what is right. He is a morally superior person. And if you're stuck in the victimhood, it may be that you're staying because you feel like you're going to lose your moral superiority. You're going to have to admit that you've done something wrong. You're going to have to carry on yourself more shame. And you're going to have to repent. And let me tell you, even if you're a Christian, we still need to repent. If you've done something evil and wicked in your life, like a murder, you should go to jail. You should spend all of the time in jail that you should, because that's what we do when we repent. If you've done something wrong, you need to go apologize to them. You need to make a right. You've stolen something, pay it back, give an extra. We need to go about the route of justice with each other, because when we've done things wrong, we need to make it right. But in order to get there, yeah, it's a hard thing to admit we've done wrong. We have to lose our moral superiority. It's no wonder John, speaking to the moral superiors called the Pharisees, when they are called to repent and be baptized, John the Baptist says this, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Show it not with your words, do something about it with, and with your words. And so the call to us is that we're stuck because, to be honest, that's scary. What are they going to say? Well, it's shameful. I want to carry more shame. Absolutely. But you know, Jesus bears your shame on the cross. It's our goal to make things right because Christ ultimately takes that shame away. Though we should be ashamed of ourselves for doing wrong, and we should shame ourselves in a sense by making it right, we shouldn't live with that shame forever because Christ bears it away. He takes that guilt. He takes that shame. But this means that if we're going to leave the victimhood, we got to know why we stay. And many of us are staying because we're not willing to release ourselves of the vengeance or the moral superiority that wants to keep us here. 
And Absalom's not going to do that. Absalom absolutely is not going to repent. In fact, what Absalom does is he runs. He takes off. We pick up with Absalom here in verse 37. Um, after he's fled, David's family in verse 34 through this next section, actually, uh, David finds out his sons were all murdered, right? He thinks everybody's gone. He's like, no, no, no. It was only Amnon. And he weeps. But Absalom, verse 37, fled and went to tell. Uh, Talmai. So I love that. It looks like Talami to me. But Talmai, and then the son of Ahimud. Uh, and basically, he's the king of Geshur. This is his, his grandpa. And he runs off to grandpa, king of, of, the, of Geshur. And David mourns for Amnon for a few days and, and, and day after day. And Absalom flees. And he was there for three whole years. In the meantime, you got David whose heart's changed. He mourns, but um, the king wants to go out to Absalom. We could interpret that as, I want to go punish him, or we could interpret that as, I want, I want him to come home. But he was comforted about Amnon. He, he knew that Amnon did wrong, but now he's dead. So now he doesn't have to deal with it. David's being a total feckless bad dad at this point. It's, it's horrible. But the bottom line is Absalom isn't willing to face the music. He hides for three years. In the middle of all of this three years of hiding, we begin to see something unfold in chapter 14. David wants his son to come back. In fact, it sounds like the whole court knows this. It sounds like the country wants Absalom back. They kind of know what's happened. And to be quite honest, they're thinking, hey, his sister was raped. That's a horrible evil. You know, Amnon deserved to die. We like what Absalom did. There was almost like everybody was behind him. To the point that Joab, this is um, David's commander of his armies, and, and his cousin says like, hey, man, let's, let's, bring, let's bring him back. But he knows David's not going to listen, so he calls on a woman from Teco who comes in and shares this story about how her older son murdered her younger son, and now the whole community wants to kill her oldest son, and it's the only son left, and please let him survive. This is horrible. And he's like, yes, yes, good, good. She's like, please don't let him be murdered. And David's like, yeah, 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 we've got this. And he's like, then why won't you bring Absalom back? And he's like, whoa, what is this? This is a setup. And she says, yeah, Joab told me to do it. And he goes, okay, fine. I'll bring Absalom back. And so, indeed, that's exactly what he does. He brings Absalom back into, the, into this area, but doesn't see Absalom. Leaves him for two years, just living on his own, but not allowed to come into the presence of the king. Absalom's not having this. In fact, what happens, though, is, that, is Absalom starts to believe that there is, there is this kind of growing community around him, a growing uh, endorsement of who he is. In fact, we see suddenly that it begins to increase. In verse 25 of chapter 14, the, the narrator just kind of drops in with suddenly this strange conversation. He says, Now in all Israel there was no one so much to be praised for his, hand, uh, or his handsome appearance as Absalom. For the soul, from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. <laughs> he was handsome. He was a devilish man. <laughs> right? I mean, they just love this guy. He is, the, he is the recent celebrity of the royals. I mean, this is the guy everybody wants and likes. Maybe they all, he's Absalom's thinking, oh, you want me as king. And this is often what they would do to think of somebody as their king. In fact, they go on to talk about his hair. Like when he cut his hair of his head, for at the very end of every year he used to cut it. It was heavy on him, and he would cut it. It weighed the hair of his head 200 shekels by the king's weight. That's five pounds. This guy had tons of hair. I mean, hairy dude, right? So there were born to Absalom three sons, one daughter. And this is strange. Three sons, one daughter, whose name was what? Tamar, the same name as his sister. Yes, Absalom's been brought in. Yes, Absalom has all this community, but he keeps reminding everybody, I'm the victim here. My sister's a victim. I'm a victim. Do you not see what's going on? Oh, woe is me, my, my sister, Tamar. So he has not let this go. He has not released this. She was a beautiful woman, just like his sister. And so Absalom lived two full years in Jerusalem without coming to the king's presence. And this drives Absalom crazy. He can't handle it. He wants to be in the presence of the king and because he's still bitter. feels like David should have done something. And we see that he hasn't moved out of the victimhood. He's still sitting there. He's still frustrated. He's still angry. And now he's got all the community behind him. He's got everybody supporting him. And this is something that happens to victims in a right way and in a bad way. We have a community that can surround us. And you may be staying because of the community that has formed around you. It may be for this community of those that surround you that you're staying in victimhood because you know they're hanging out with you because you're a victim, because they feel for your cause, they love you. People have rallied around you, and that can feel amazing, in fact, is addicting. And they've shown this because there have been people in our culture who have faked victimhood in a horrible way 
just to gain the community. One woman up north actually was poisoning her daughter. And the community started rallying around her. She was saying, my daughter's so sick. She has this rare disease. Nobody knows what it is. I mean, she's trying to earn money and gain all this insight and all this stuff. And she's going to doctors, demanding of the doctors that she do, they do something. The whole time she was poisoning her daughter just to get the celebrity of victimhood, just to get the community to surround her and uplift her and pray over her and love on her. Oh, poor lady. And she was a wicked person. Look, that's, that's not what we are, but the danger is that this is how powerful that community feeling can be. In a, in a world where internet's all you got, you can have hundreds of people want to support you, come out for you, care for you, be all over you. And, and this is, it's a double-edged sword because on one side, it's going to bring you comfort, and that is good. If you're a true victim, you need that community to lift you up and hold on to you. The danger is when that community is there because you're only a victim and doesn't want to help you move to healing. Because when that happens, they wind up being an enabling group. It's like the aid earlier. It's like the homeless who are gathering together, understanding your homeless plight. And hey, I love you. And suddenly when we would help, try to help out the homeless, they felt like they were leaving their family, so they didn't want to leave. It was the very community that was keeping them in their victimhood. It's the drug addicts who hang out together, supporting each other's ad addictions that won't let them move on. This is the danger of flocking together in our harms. Victims will gather victims and they'll flock together for the sake of just, you understand me but not for healing, just for some kind of community connection. And you can fear the loss of that community, but note this, it's not a good community. A community formed in your victimhood is an unhealthy community, and what you need is a community that's aimed at your health so that you can have a healthy community. In the end, that community should release so that you can move on to a healthy, good, and wholesome community that may be beyond those people at some point. That's okay. But we need to be willing to mourn that we're going to have to let some people go. We're going to need to mourn that we're going to have to say goodbye to certain aspects of community. Even Jesus, when he said, come follow me, I'm the victor, he said, you're going to have to, if you don't love me more than your father, your mother, your sister, your brother, all these people, then you can't come after me. In other words, you can't allow the community to keep you away from your victory. You've got to follow after Christ. And so we need to be encouraged by a community that moves you forward into a community that has health for you. And so, yes, there's a community beyond it, but you've got to release the ones that may be holding you back for now in order to move forward. And that may be one of the reasons we stay in victimhood. Absalom definitely isn't going to let that go. In fact, what he's going to do, he's going to use it. He's going to use that community to give him something that he's always wanted. See, the people knew what was going on. They knew that this guy had been a victim and all these things. And so, eventually, Absalom only needed one more thing. He wanted one more thing in his victimhood. Now he had community support. He was viewed as, a, as this person. He, he had all of this stuff going on. Now all he needed was power. He needed power to make his vengeance final and fulfilled. He wanted it to be dealt with. And the only way he could finally deal with this evil that had happened to his family and him is to deal with dad. And he needed power to do that. So he burns down Joab's field to get Joab's attention to say, I want to talk to my dad. And Joab goes to David, and David goes, okay, fine. And they come in, and David all reconciles and is crying. That's not what Absalom was about. See, Absalom goes out, and we see this in the next chapter, get chapter 15. He gets himself a chariot. He's riding around and showing off his flowing hair. Like, you know, it's like amazing. He looks like Fabio, you know. Yeah, this whole thing's going on. And people are, like, attracted to him. And suddenly he would go to the, the gate, and he would have a conversation with them. And in this conversation, he would begin to talk to the people. And we see this in 15, beginning in verse 2. It says, And Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way of the gate. And when any man had a dispute to come before the king for judgment, Absalom would call to him and say, From what city are you? And when he said, Your servant is of such and such a tribe in Israel, Absalom would say, See, your claims are good and right. But there's no man designated by the king to hear you. What? Now, we know that David's already dealt with justice all a whole bunch of times and, and mercy and things like that with, his, with Absalom. In the past, he's done these things. But now, Absalom's like, dude, my dad's not going to hear you out. He didn't hear me out. He's not going to hear you out. He's not going to hear you. So you. Come to me. Come to me. See your claims. They're good and right. You're the victim. Notice what he's doing here. There's no man designated by the king to hear you. Then Absalom say, oh, that there were to be a judge in the land. <coughs> me. Right? And then every man with a dispute or cause might come to me, and I would give him justice. Ah, power. Here's the danger. 
Whenever you're in victimhood, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to realize there are other people that are there too. And if, if you're in victimhood, one of the things you might have to let go of is the influence that you gain. There is an influence that is given to you as a victim that can often be used in our culture to give you a power over other people. And this is what he does. He says, I see you're a victim. I'm a victim. You come with me. Now, that man may have been a victim or not been a victim. He may have been the perpetrator. It didn't matter to Absalom. Absalom just wanted everybody else to identify as a victim so he could control them. So he could get them on his side. So he could start his coup and get rid of his father, which he will do in a minute. But I want us to realize there is influence you gain and I can gain if we stay in victimhood. And it's a power. In fact, it's the power that a lot of people will use. Well, you haven't gone through this. You don't know what it's really like. That kind of a comment is intended to shut down conversation, to keep people from revealing that they're, they're living in a victim mentality. In fact, many of us may not have experienced what it's like, but we can know what something is. In fact, this is how God works. God has never experienced sin, but he knows it's bad, better than we do. And in fact, let me just advise that you need a counselor and a help from somebody who, yeah, in some ways stands apart from that situation who can give you advice and direction. But the influence that you can gain by gathering people around you is something that you may need to let go of. You may need to let go of the fact that you could have that power. And the reason I think we really need to get out of here is because there's somebody who's ready to use you. There's always somebody seeking power ready to use a victim. Governments love to do this. Look, churches will do this. There are people who want to pull you into their very situation and, and drop you in here. here. And there's a twist in the story. This may have been Absalom's plot the entire time. To make his sister a victim, to get power over Amnon, to take over the kingdom, to give himself power. This, some people read it that way. And Absalom is using the entire setup like a grand conspiracy to take power because he knew he could manipulate a victim. We can't be looking to everyone who offers us power because that's how you get dictators. The Nazis rose to power by making Germany feel like victims. And when they finally said, we will give you power, we will give you strength, we will give you pride, they fell for it hook, line, and sinker. And in our culture today, we need to be warned. If you feel like a victim, man, our, our politics are ready, ripe, and prime to use you, not to heal you. And what I want you to do is be healed. No longer be a victim. Be back in the life that God gave you to manage your life, to be following after the victor, Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. We need to watch because they are ready to promise you. They're ready to scam you. They're ready to use you. And we need to move out of victimhood because the influence you think you may be gaining may not be what you think you're gaining. I guarantee everybody who walked up to Absalom thought they were gaining some influence. And they weren't. They were just listening to a power-hungry young man. Now, at the same time, we have to be willing to let go of power. You may have gained some power in a group, power in a church, power in a situation because you've been victimized at some level. And you've been using that power to stop some evil. And here's the thing. I'm not saying that's wrong uh, to, to stop an evil that's in this world. I'm saying that if your life is dedicated to the cause of your trauma, you have been stuck in victimhood and it may be keeping you there. And so what am I saying to you? You're like, well, wait, wait, wait. You're telling me to release the power that I have? In some ways, yes, I am. Because if God's going to grant you the power, you need to use it for God's intentions and God's purposes, not for your own. God's given us the justice system, and there are ways forward. If you haven't used the justice system yet, then yeah, do that. You may feel like you've got to reform the justice system. Okay, awesome. There's the church system, right? We've got those systems where we want to, there's spiritual discipline and stuff like that. And then there's God himself, like I said, and God is the one who brings that vengeance. God is the one who brings that power. God is the one who puts these things down. It is God's power and God's influence that he may give you to deal with these things. But again, we want to do it in the way of Christ. We can't excuse our evil. We can't be morally superior. We can't think that our power is good because the bottom line is power in a sinner's hand is dangerous. And so I encourage you, as you release it, release it to God. Let him be judge. Let him be the power. Let him give you the power and mourn that, yeah, these traumas happen in life. And it's no wonder that Jesus tells us two of his Beatitudes together. He tells us, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. You may have to mourn all these things. You may have to mourn that influence. You have to mourn that power. You may have to mourn 
that community. You have to mourn that aid. You have to mourn these things, but he promises you will be comforted. And then he goes on, blessed are the meek, those who aren't going to seek the power, but those who are going to just trust in God, for they shall inherit the earth. The ultimate thing is all that will be righted because God will write it. We will be the inheritors. The power will come, but it will come in Christ, not in our own victimhood, not in our own way. And I want to encourage you, there's a greater power in this world. There's a greater victory, a greater justice. There's a greater aid. There is a greater community found when we follow the victor. But it was going to call you to let go of your life in order to gain it. Because if you hold on, you will lose your life. And that is exactly what we see with Absalom. What we see with Absalom is that he wrecks his life. He takes off and he starts a coup against his father. And he starts that fight, and he, his, David runs out, and uh, Absalom gathers another man, another victim. His name is Ahithophel. He was the wisest man in David's council. But Ahithophel was Uriah's father. And so suddenly, you've got another victim who hates that David killed Uriah to sleep with his wife Bathsheba and have these kids. And so Ahithophel wants to destroy David, and Absalom wants to destroy David, and a league of victims are angry and ready for their own vengeance, gathered together in a coup, and in the end go after David doing horrible things. But Ahithophel sees where it's going, and he commits suicide. Absalom, in the middle of the war and the battle, finds himself in this situation. And Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under thick branches of a great oak. And his head caught fast in the oak, and he was suspended between heaven and earth. And while the mule that was under him went on, just off it goes. And a certain man told Joab, Behold, I saw Absalom hanging on an oak tree. And they're like, and Joab then said, oh, I'm not going to waste time with you like this. I'm going to go after him. So he took three javelins in his hand, thrust them in the heart of Absalom while he was still alive in the oak. And ten young men, Joab's armor bearers, surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. Absalom dies in what was considered by the Jewish people a death of a curse. Cursed is anyone who hangs in a tree, the scripture says. And here's the thing, if you're going to Try to keep your life, keep your power, keep your community, and you're going to do it out of victimhood, you're going to lose your life. See, victimhood destroys, so let's deal with the costs. Let's pay these now, because here's the thing. When Jesus was hung on a tree, he became our curse. And if you are willing to die to yourself and allow Christ to be your curse and follow the victor, then you will have dealt with those costs of that guilt, that shame, that power, and he will bring you into the community of the church. He will bring you in the aid of his infinite infinite provision. He will give you eternal life. He will give you His power uh, from the Spirit of God. You will inherit the earth. He will comfort you in your mourning. He will get you past this trauma into healing. Jesus Christ leads us as a victor, but it begins with understanding you have to lose your life. You have to lose the victimhood and all of these purpose things that you have put around it in order to gain it. What keeps us there are many things. But the way out is to follow the victim. Maybe today you need to begin to do that. Maybe you need to let Jesus hang on the cross to be the curse that you've created in your life. Or you can go for it yourself. And you'll see that victimhood will destroy. But I don't want you there. I want you to follow the victor Jesus Christ out. I'm encouraging you to find him in healing. And maybe today is that chance that he would bear your curse, that he would bear the shame that you feel for the things you've done wrong and the guilt that you've incurred that you have to pay for and that he will pay for it before God and he will take away that shame before God and give us the courage then to go out and make things right and justice or we've done wrong. He will definitely deal with the evils in our life and he will enable you to forgive and move on to the things that we're going to talk about next week as we pack up. But in order to do that, you have to receive Christ. I want to give you that chance to receive this gift of him being your curse, your, your guilt bearer, your shame bearer, your sin bearer, and he takes it from you to give you life and to inherit the eternal world. If you want that right now, I want to give you that opportunity to do so. Would you bow your heads with me? And just pray this. Father in heaven, I ask that you would forgive me my sins. I trust that Jesus Christ has borne my guilt, my shame, and borne my sin. I trust that you are giving me life, and I trust that you will take me now. I give you my life. I give you my life, and that you would give me life. And now I'm ready to follow you. Lead me, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that 
we're saying congratulations. Thank you for being a part of that. Let us know. You can simply let us know by texting um, the idea of uh, begin right here at the bottom of the screen or just let somebody know right there in the chat that you've made this decision. We want to get a hold of you. We want to help you begin this journey. We want to become part of that community that helps you grow. Uh, maybe you need to come in and check in with the church. We're here during the week. Come contact us and connect with us. We love you and we know that God is working in you. So all of us in the church who are here, who have identified these things, let's begin to move on. Let's start packing up. And that's where we're going to go to next week. What's it going to take to begin to move? We're going to look at that. God bless you guys. I hope you have a great week, and we'll see you next week. Hey, thank you for joining us today. And don't forget, if you know somebody that needs to hear this message, don't be afraid to share it with them on Facebook or YouTube, uh, or invite them to join us online or in person next week. And again, if you're looking for ways to connect with others, maybe grow spiritually, there's a couple ways you can do that. Um, the men's breakfast is going to be Saturday, April 24th at 8 a.m. It's going to be at the B Building Kids Block. You just have to show up and eat breakfast and hear a message, but it'll be a great time of fellowship. So again, men's breakfast, April 24th at 8 a.m. Also, women's is having a Bible study starting, the engraved women's study. It starts at the end of April. It meets every Wednesday, morning and night. So just text engraved to the text number if you want to sign up or get more information and somebody will be in contact with you. All right, have a great day.